mystery's edge watching for a startling luminescence or word to guide us in, in fragile, fragile occurrence the holy one, one presents oneself and, and we must pause. pause daily there are glimmers reflections of a seamless mercy revealed in common details these in circles, circles of grace spill out around us and, and announce that, that we are part of this mystery. mystery we see the presence of god's beauty reflected in our communities and in our world we feel the warmth of God's love in the returning sun, the mass of strangers, and the texts of friends. Let us pray. We give thanks for the opportunity we have to worship and celebrate this day. May we be surrounded with the very real sense of your presence, the source and sustainer of all that exists. As we spend this time together, and as the sun rises each day in perfect newness, so may we break upon this in every new day with splendor and expectation, renewed creatures, inspired and challenged by your spirit of wisdom. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Welcome, friends. I'm Melissa Junk, and I'm the lead minister here at the First Congregational Church of Burlington, United Church of Christ. This is a place, as you can see, that appreciates beauty in sanctuary, in speech, in song. But our greatest beauty is actually you, because we believe that you are made in the image of God just as you are. And our greatest strength is in joining together in worship and in thanksgiving. So no matter who you are, 
Whether it is your first time or your 500th time worshiping with us, whether you are dressed to the nines or whether you are still in your pajamas, whether you come full of faith or full of doubt, full of sorrow or full of joy, gay or straight, sinner and saint, street smart or college educated, we are glad that you are here. Now this morning we will celebrate the sacrament of communion. So I would encourage you to find some bread and a cup if you have them that we might be joined in the community of this meal. And I would invite you to light a candle if you have one, that you might be reminded that the light of this community, the light of God, well, it can reach you wherever and whoever you are. Thanks be to God and let us worship. sight, no gracious words we hear, for of Christ who spoke as none has spoke, who still we know is near. We may not touch Christ's hands and side, nor follow where Christ trod, but in confessing we A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Listen now for the Spirit of God speaking to you. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails, and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of this scripture. Dear friends, Though we call ourselves a community of faith, like Thomas, we so often struggle to trust what we haven't experienced ourselves. And while we know that God is not threatened by our longing for certainty, we also sometimes need Jesus' reminder that even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. So in our time of confession today, may we honestly reflect on our experience living in that tension between faith and doubt. Let us pray. God, you call us to walk by faith, yet perhaps too often we find ourselves led by doubt. We doubt that healing is possible. We doubt that broken relationships can be restored. We doubt that the miracle will come for us. Lord, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. We doubt that we will see an end to racism, war, and violence. We doubt that justice will be done. 
We doubt that we can truly make a difference in the face of so much suffering. Lord, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. We doubt that you are as good as we've been promised. We doubt that you hear us when we pray. We doubt that your love is for us, just as we are. Lord, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. We doubt that we belong in church. We doubt that what we read in scripture is true. We doubt that this confession changes anything at all. Yet here we are in our doubt, daring to lift these words up to you. Lord, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. You are not alone in your doubts, nor are you condemned for them. Just as Jesus met Thomas exactly where he was with love and reassurance, so too will God come and be with you in the midst of your deepest uncertainty. So while you may struggle with doubt, know that your mustard seed of faith is more than enough to move mountains. It is through God's love that you have already been forgiven, set free, and made new. Now, like Thomas, you are invited to follow Christ with your doubts and all and establish the kingdom of God here. Amen. Now let us pass the peace and hear stories of how faith in this community has been confirmed and affirmed in spite of doubt. My mother loved working in her garden. When my parents moved to my house, the plantings were largely shrubs and lilacs and daylilies. One day we got to talking about her love of a garden, but her health made it difficult to start one. So I called my friend Chris, who had a gardening business, to put in a front and back garden. The front garden came first and was filled with perennials that bloomed from spring to fall. Then work on the back garden began, but mom passed away before it was finished. On the day the garden was finished, I placed a bird bath, a gift from my school upon my retirement, in the middle of the garden. I was feeling a bit blue as I walked away from filling the bird bath, thinking about how much my mother would have loved the garden. My friend suddenly yelled, Susan, look! I turned around to see a morning dove already in the bird bath. Your mother knows the garden is done, Chris said. I like to think that moment was given to me just when I needed it. Good morning. Thomas was unable to be with us here today, but I can share what I learned from Thomas in a Zoom interview that I was unable to record. I asked Thomas if it hurt to be called Doubting Thomas. His answer, yes, it does. It is true, I did doubt Jesus was alive, but I had seen him dead and buried. Who among you would not doubt? that he had been seen by others. Would the other disciples have believed Mary, who had seen our Lord, had he not appeared to them as well? There have been Elvis sightings in your day. Do you believe Elvis lives? I needed to see Jesus too. I was much more than one who doubted what I could not imagine. I was the one who called the other disciples to follow Jesus to Bethany when Lazarus had died. 
I knew there was much danger in this journey, and I would have died with Jesus rather than to be left behind. I was faithful to our Lord Jesus, proclaiming him as my Lord and my God. I believed and taught many others about Jesus and his ways. In the end, I died spreading the good news that Jesus had died and lived again. So yes, it hurts to be called doubting. It hurts to be name called and it hurts to be remembered for my doubts and not my strong beliefs. My next question to Thomas was, is it okay to have doubts? Thomas replied, of course, by doubting you question and in questioning you seek answers. Looking for answers you learn and you become stronger in what you believe in and what you have faith in. My advice to children in your church is to ask questions. Never stop learning. Questioning is a strong tool used to make sense of the unknown and the unseen. Dig deeper and in digging deeper, find a more meaningful faith. So ends our interview with Thomas today. Please join Debson, Miss Lorette, and me on Sunday mornings at 9.30 for church school. See you next week. Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas, too, Matthew, and Bartholomew. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. He called them one by one. James, the one they called the less, Simon, also Thaddeus, the twelfth disciple, Judas made. Jesus was by him betrayed. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Called them, he called them one by one. Yes, Jesus calls me. Yes, Jesus calls me. Yes, Jesus calls me. He calls us one by one. Hi there. Is this thing even recording? Oh gosh. I'm not good with all these online meetings. You know, they didn't have such things in my day. But I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to speak to you all at First Church for myself. You see, I was there. Me, Thomas, one of his so-called disciples. I watched him die. Have you any idea what it's like to watch all your dreams, all your hopes, all your ambitions being crucified on a rough wooden cross and then die right before your eyes? All I dreamed of, all I hoped for was in that man, Jesus. I watched him die. I was there when the soldiers came and broke the legs of those two criminals executed with Jesus so they would die more quickly. And coming to Jesus' body and seeing he was already dead, one of the soldiers took a long spear and stabbed it up into his side. He couldn't look. And I watched those two hypocrites, Joseph and Nicodemus, religious leaders who hadn't said a word before. Oh, they were so brave going to ask Pontius Pilate for his body. Why hadn't they said anything when he was alive? But I guess it was good I saw this for myself because now I know he was not who I thought he was because if he had done, he'd still be alive. As they took his body down off the cross and started to wrap it in a long piece of cloth, I couldn't take it anymore. All my dreams were going to the grave with that man. So I ran away. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. And I wept until there were no more tears in my eyes. I couldn't face being with anyone else anymore. 
It hurt too much. And so, for the next couple of days, I tried to keep away from everyone, even the other disciples. But I thought that as a follower of Jesus, I was a wanted man. So I decided to go back where I knew the other disciples would be hiding. When I arrived in the place, it took me forever just to get the courage to ask them to give the secret knock. And I just, as I stood alone in the darkness, I made a decision. I wasn't going to be fooled again. That man had already shattered my heart. No. Jesus was dead. End of story. When I finally knocked on the door, it swung open, and Peter grabbed my arm and pulled me inside. Something was wrong. Why didn't he look sad? And then he gave me a great big hug and said, Isn't God amazing, Thomas? Is he insane? How could God make Jesus' death amazing? And then he looked into my red, bloodshot eyes and said, You haven't heard, have you, Thomas? Heard what? I shouted. That you're an idiot? I knew that years ago. And then he laughed. He actually laughed. What? I yelled. What haven't I heard? Thomas, he's alive. Who's alive? What are you talking about? Jesus, he's alive, Thomas. We've all seen him. You're mad, I shouted. I saw his cold and lifeless body on the cross. I watched one of the soldiers stick a spear in his side. I began to weep again. What kind of cruel trick are you trying to play on me? The others are all looking at me now, smiling like I'm the crazy one. But it's true, Thomas. We saw him ourselves, Thomas. He appeared in this room, Thomas. He showed us his hands and his side, Thomas. Shut up. Shut up, all of you. Don't you understand? Dead bodies don't come back to life. Somehow they all believed that somehow God had raised Jesus from the dead and he had appeared to them in that room. Ha, right. I wasn't being taken in again, not me. That man had already shattered enough of my heart. So I screamed at them, listen, unless I see him standing right here before me and he shows me his hands and his side and I can put my finger in the holes left by the nails and my fist in the tear left by that spear, I will not believe it. And then I ran out into the night as angry as I've ever been. One of the most uncomfortable weeks of my life followed that day. Jesus was dead and gone, and my so-called friends had been taken over by some kind of mass madness. I felt really alone. I tried to keep away from them, but after a week, I had to go back for some reason or other. When I arrived, there they were, just as full of it as they were before. When they let me in the room, they bolted the door behind me, and then they started with all those lies. Oh, we've seen him, Thomas. He came and saw us, Thomas. I wasn't having any of it until I heard his voice. Thomas. And when I turned to look, there he was, just as I remembered him. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a vision or some imagining in my head. He was right there, right in front of me, as plain as could be. He was real. The same Jesus I had known and loved these last three years. He looked right at me, right into me as before. But before I could get a word out, he spoke again. Thomas, he said. And then he held out his hands so I could see the wounds left in them. And then, taking a step forward, he pointed to the holes of his hands and said, Thomas, reach out your finger and put it here. Shaking, I reached out my hand and touched the place where the nail had gone. And then he pulled his cloak to one side so that I could see the wound left by the spear. Thomas, he said, reach out your fist, feel my wound. I didn't move. I didn't have to, because I knew it was true. Jesus was alive. 
Stop doubting, Thomas, he said, and believe. Now, I have no doubt left. Not now that I saw him face to face, the same Jesus I had known and loved these past three years. So I did the only thing I could do. Falling to my knees, I worshipped him, my Lord and my God. And then he spoke to me one last time. He said, Thomas, you believe because you see me. But there's a greater blessing for those who haven't seen me and yet still believe I'm alive. Well, now I still doubt sometimes. If you don't have doubts, you're either kidding yourself or you're asleep. I don't doubt that Jesus appeared to me and rose from the dead, but I doubt myself and the others as we try to spread this good news. Now, I have to live by faith, a faith that trusts, and even though we may not find, we know, may not know what we are doing, God can redeem anything, even a skeptic such as me. We are telling Thomas' story. We are telling Thomas' story. We are telling Thomas' story. Sisters, brothers, all. Here we seek and find seek and find our story. Here we seek and find our story, sisters, brothers, all. Will you pray with me? God, may these words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts bring us closer to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In case you missed it, NPR did a segment this week on conspiracy theories and disinformation campaigns and the growing number of Americans who believe them. Take a listen. This is a scandemic, it's a plandemic, and it's a damn-demic. In some parts of the country, the threats against public health workers have gotten so bad that officials are resigning. And the disinformation is not only about the pandemic. It's also about things like voting. In many places, those conspiracy theories are actually leading to some big policy changes. A controversial election bill clears another hurdle at the state capitol. It would add voting restrictions to upcoming elections. Republicans in Georgia are pushing a new law that would make it harder to vote in a bunch of ways. Less early voting, a shorter absentee voting window, a new ID requirement. At least 40 states are considering similar bills. In Georgia, Andre Gillespie of Emory University says the voting bill would disproportionately hurt lower income voters, people of color and Democrats. What does it mean when you see legislators responding with legislative and policy proposals that would be aimed to address a problem that in fact didn't exist in the first place? This disinformation is not contained on one side of the political spectrum, of course. Across the country, studies have found that the higher the median income in a place and the greater percentage of college-educated white people, the higher the rate of vaccination exemptions, meaning College-educated, often liberal white people are the ones who believe the conspiracy theories about vaccines. All of this is telling us that it's often our desire for touch that deceives us and pits us against one another. My child is fine without the vaccine, so it must not be necessary. It might even be harmful. Or think of how long we have ignored the statistics around racial injustice and the lived experience of 40% of the population because it doesn't fit our understanding of the nice cop in our family. It is far easier to trust the people that you know and love than to believe an entire system is fundamentally flawed. How many say, I do not believe in global warming? Look, Texas just froze over and that I can believe and touch. My wallet is empty. Why should they receive help and not me? This disinformation campaign, all of this is not a new phenomenon, this strange relationship with truth. Often it has even been framed like 
science, like the racist phrenology studies or understandings of biological sex, none of which is dissimilar to a current member of Congress who hilariously posted a sign outside her office saying, trust the science on gender, which is not a scientific category at all. But social media and the internet have made our tenuous relationship with truth more obvious, exposing the extent to which our entire life is constructed around faiths, not just that which happens within the bounds of religious community and experience. When folks tell me they don't believe in God, my first question always is, what do you believe in? Because everything we do requires faith. Everything. The pieces of paper you carry in your wallet, the stock market, the strength of government institutions, the state of your marriage, yes, even science. And when institutions come crashing down, as so many of ours have over the past four years, the past year, well, each of us has to decide where to put our faith and what to believe. And what more grounding truth is there than the source for and ultimate finality of life and death? That's the question of today's scripture. Over the years, Thomas has been vilified for his doubt and celebrated for his rationalism, and both, of course, are true, and both reflect our human experience. And Jesus, well, he has compassion for both. In fact, part of me has always wondered whether Jesus chose to appear the first time when Thomas wasn't there, precisely because he knew that Thomas wouldn't just go along, but that he would require something more. And his questions would reveal for all of us who followed this central question of discipleship. What can we have faith in? And where does our doubt lead us astray? Far from condemning him, Jesus appears directly to him and gives Thomas precisely what he needs, perhaps because he knows that he will not be able to do so for all of us that follow. Then again, of the disciples, Thomas most clearly brings the questions of modern experience to the fore what and whom to believe when everything falls apart. Who do you trust and what is truth? And Jesus's answer, well, that's clear as well. Have faith in this, the way of Jesus, the truth of God, and the light that brings you life. Whom should we trust? Well, like Thomas, we are called to trust in one another, as difficult as that might be, in our companions on the way. Not just the ones who look like us or think like us, but the ones who follow the way. Healing the sick, standing with the oppressed, lifting up the voices of those who are marginalized and comforting the brokenhearted. These are the markers of truth because these are the marks of Jesus, the marks of God, the scars of God. Touch and see. Friends, I know that this has been a pressure cooker of a year to say the least, and I know it feels like everything has fallen away. Like Thomas, we might feel that we are standing at the end wondering where it all went wrong. But like Thomas, I would encourage you to remember that we have now seen plainly the scars of oppression and brutality, injustice and isolation and greed, touch and see the marks of God. And so, like Thomas, what we are facing now is not the end, but the beginning. If only we have the faith to make it so. My Lord and my God, may it be so. Oh, 
Thomas found that God was more creative than he could possibly have imagined. And that's what we hope with our time of offering, that the green pieces of paper we trust become more beautiful and more bountiful in God's hands, that we become more beautiful and more bountiful in God's hands. So we take this moment in worship to dedicate ourselves. You can do that in several ways. You can dedicate your time. Today, after worship, please think about joining us if you're able for our racial justice vigil from 1 to 1.30 on the lawn. Bringing cardboard to stand on helps keep those toes warm, and donations to the food shelf are always welcome at that time. You can also dedicate your prayers during our offertory. The prayer concerns that have come in over the course of the week are going to be displayed. Jot them down. Send a card if you're able. Pray them over the week. And make a gift of your presence. Sign our online connection card. It's listed below the video title, particularly if you're new here in our worship. And if you're interested in learning more about First Church and exploring membership, or if you simply want to spend some time with Hannah and me, mark your calendars for the next three Sundays at nine, when we'll be hosting our exploring membership gatherings. Please note that you do not need to join to attend. Also, friends, think about how you use your financial resources. Do you spend them in ways that multiply the ways of God? If you are able, you can make a financial contribution by clicking on the link below the video or texting FCCBUCC to 73256. But whatever you do, whatever you do, may it bring you closer to the truth of Jesus that in giving we receive. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Holy God of all creativity, may these gifts of our livelihoods and our very lives be transformed and transforming in your grand economy of grace. Amen. Friends, we come now to the table, and as the deacons give the invitation, I would invite you, if you haven't already, to round up some bread and a cup. If you have pretzels, that would be especially relevant this day, as pretzels have long been associated with Lent, the unleavened bread of the Passover feast crossed into the shape of hands praying, for centuries now linked with this season in the church year. But we trust that God is not picky about the loaf or the leaven, and we invite you to the table this day, no matter what it is you have at home. Henry Nelson Wyman has said that faith is a transforming and activating belief. It is a belief becoming dynamic, functioning in life. What we call our faith is the total integrated structure of all of our beliefs made coherent and rational, and constantly tested out, and either reaffirmed or corrected by continuing life experience. It becomes the foundation for our personal morale and morale, morals as we confront the challenges of daily life. Like Thomas, we are called to touch and see here with things of this table. In the 40 days of Lent, we remember the love made manifest in the birth, life, and untimely death of Jesus of Nazareth. In his healing acts and radical teachings, we recall the words he spoke to call forth love, care, and respect for one another. We are grateful for this assurance of love amidst human betrayal, care amidst hatred, respect amidst oppression. And so, with Elizabeth who prophesied your birth, Mary who was the first to understand you as the Christ, and Peter and Thomas and all who sought to follow in your way, we join with the whole universe saying, Holy, 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 vulnerable God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. When he had washed their feet, showed them the way of service one last time, he gave them something to remember him by. He gave thanks for that unleavened bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup, that cup of redemption, and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to say, them, saying, This is the cup, my covenant with you. As you do this, each time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now, friends, what is left to do is to bring ourselves to this time in prayer, to bring our whole selves to God and one another. So I would invite you to leave your comments, your prayers in the comment section that we might hold one another in true communion in this time. And let us pray. Holy Spirit of the universe, life and breath and beating heart, we begin our prayer in gratitude, not simply for the times when your presence is clearest, the bluebird skies and powdered days full of laughter and hugs. God, we miss hugs so much. Which brings us to the next part of our prayer, I guess, that we also give you thanks for the times of doubt and shadow, for we strive to understand that though you do not cause them, you use them to show us your hands and your side and your scars, your human hands and human hurting, to lead us back to your way, your truth, and your life. That with those who suffer and those who struggle against suffering, we will find you. God, so lead us back now. For we give you thanks for the knowledge that you do not desert us, 
even when we cannot sense your presence around us, for the faith of community which holds us when we cannot hold ourselves for the miracle of another day to practice our faith. For we know now that that is what it is, a practice, a walking, a doing, a hope transformed into reality with our very lives. And so we ask for your presence here with us this day, or more accurately, that we might be aware of your presence here this day, as certainly as Thomas knew you on that day so long ago. That you, Holy Spirit, might be everywhere in this meal, everywhere this meal is, that partaking with those stretched across the city and this country, participating now, we might proclaim, my Lord and my God, so real are you to us in this bread and this cup, that as we go forward, we might be your real presence to a community and a world so very much in need. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus and with the words he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now friends, Jesus knew, when he sat those disciples down, that their faith was about to be tested that it was going to get dark and they would need a reminder to choose love, to choose forgiveness, to that his presence was always near. And the first time this meal was served, one was there who would deny him. One was there who would betray them. One was there who would doubt him. All of them, each and every one would leave when the going got tough. But still he broke bread with them trusted them with his final moments and message. So too, he will break bread with you, no matter who you are or what you have done or what you have left undone, no matter where you are and no matter what you believe or, like Thomas, struggle to believe. This is God's meal, not ours. So may you know God's presence in it this day. I'm going to invite you to take your bread now. Take a piece of it dip it in your cup. This is called communion by intinction. You can serve yourself or you can serve each other's if you are with others. God's presence will be the same. So friends. Bread, the very stuff of life, broken for you. Wine, the fruit of the vine and celebration poured out for you. Let us share this bread and wine, knowing that our lives are forever changed by this and every breaking of bread. The meal of God for the people of God. All things are ready. Let us sing now together our prayer of thanksgiving, brothers, sisters, friends. Let us pray, pray. 
Friends, in just a few moments, I do hope that you will join me for a time of fellowship over Zoom, and that if you are able, I might see you in person outside here at one o'clock. But until then, and far beyond, may you love God so much that you love nothing else too much. May you have enough faith in Jesus to have faith for the work ahead. And may you fear God just enough that you need fear nothing else at all, ever again. May it be so. Amen. Go in peace.